live now. Okay. Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to this meeting of the Health and Adult Social Care Overview and Scrutiny Committee. I'm Councillor Karen Calder, and I'm obliged to inform you this meeting is being live streamed and recorded. Members of the public will be able to hear the audio of the meeting and view the papers shown on the screen. This meeting is being held using remote technology and should any members experience technical difficulties during the meeting, they should immediately contact the designated IT officer on the number they have already been supplied with. Everyone is requested to mute their microphones unless asked to speak. Please only use the chat function to indicate the desire to speak. Do not use it for anything else. As chair, I will interpret the council's existing standing orders in light of the requirements of remote participation with advice from the monitoring office officer prior to making a ruling. At the start of the meeting, I will ask members of the committee to confirm their presence and of any disclosable pecuniary interests they might have on any items on the agenda. I will ask everyone to speak during the meeting, including members of the committee and officers to introduce themselves each time before they speak. Um, I'm going to ask members now to uh, to to uh, introduce themselves. Um, I will read out each member's name and ask them to confirm their presence and any interests that they might have. Um, my name is Councillor Karen Calder. I have no interest to declare. Roy Oldcroft. Uh, good morning. Uh, I have no interest to declare. Thank you, Roy. Gerald Aiken. Good morning. I've got no pecuniary, no pecuniary interest to declare. Thank you. Kate Halliday. Good morning. I have an interest to declare, which is I work for a professional body of which the Addiction Services in Shropshire is a member of. Thank you. That's noted. Simon Harris. Uh, no interest to declare. Thank you. Tracy Huffer. Um, yes, um, uh, I'm present, Karen. Um, my only interest is my usual one, which is I'm employed by Station Drive Surgery, which is a GP surgery in Ludlow, just in case, but I don't think it will be applicable today. OK, that's noted. Thank you, Tracy. Simon Jones. Good morning, uh, yes, yeah, Simon Jones. I have uh, no pecuniary interest to declare. Thank you. Heather Kidd. Uh, yes, I'm here and uh, I have no pecuniary, no interest to declare. Thank you. Paul Milner. OK, we can pick him up if he, if he joins us later on. Matt Shinton. I have no pecuniary interests, but I still belong to Health Concern Kidderminster Hospital. Thank you, Matt, that's noted. Um, we have other participants in the meeting. Can they confirm their presence, please? Um, David Voisey, Health Watch. Councillor Lee Chapman, Chair of Health and Wellbeing Board. Yes, good morning, present. Good morning, Lee. Um, Rachel Robinson, Director of Public Health, will be joining us shortly. She's currently tied up with um, a telephone conversation re-COVID. Um, Tanya Miles, Assistant Director, Social Care and Housing. Tanya will be joining us later, I'm sure. Deborah Webster. Yeah, it looks as if those officers in relation to that agenda item will be joining us. Joining us at that time. OK, um, then we've got uh, Daniel Webb. Overview and scrutiny officer and Amanda. Uh, I'm present here, Chair, yes. Thank you. Um, um, Amanda, we know you're here. Thank you very yes. much. I now turn to the items on the agenda. Um, item one is apologies. Have we received any apologies? No apologies received, Chair. Thank you very much. Um, disclosable pecuniary interests. Well, these have been dealt with during the initial roll call of the meeting. And should um, Councillor um, Paul Milner join us, we can we can clarify that as he joins us. Item three, um, the minutes of the um, uh, of the last meeting. I'd like to move the minutes to the Health and Adult Social Care Review and Scrutiny meeting held on the 20th of July 2020 as circulated with the agenda papers to be signed as a correct record. Could I have a seconder please? I'll second that Chairman. Thank you very Thanks, much. Shinton. 
Um, thank you, um, Councillor Shineton. I will now accept these minutes as a true and accurate record unless anyone indicates differently. Um, item four is public question time. Um, no questions have been received. Um, item five is member question time. Again, no member questions have been received. That allows us to move on to the um, on to the items uh, on the agenda. Um, item six is the health and well-being sub boards uh, subgroups. Sorry, um, as titled. Um, as we have, uh, Val Cross is the author of the paper, but she's unable to attend the meeting. So um, thank you very much to uh, the chair of the Health and Wellbeing Board. And at some point, um, Rachel Robinson, the director of public health, they'll be presenting. Are you happy to lead on this, Lee? Yes, Karen. Um, and I assume that all members of the committee have had the paper. Um, yes. What I'd like to do, I certainly don't propose going through the uh, the individual detail of the paper, but I think it would be helpful if I draw out some of the broad themes, if that's acceptable. That's perfect. Thank you, Luke. OK, so um, the Shropshire Health and Wellbeing Board um, has a statutory role within Shropshire. Um, it's a board that we are uh, required to uh, to have in place and it has several statutory partners that are obligated to attend the Health and Wellbeing Board. Um, you'll see from the uh, initial purpose at the paper that our vision, the vision of the board is for Shropshire people to be the healthiest and most fulfilled in England. And we aim to achieve that um, through a number um, of, uh, of objectives and aims, principally around improving our population's health and well-being through reducing health inequalities. And I think this is really important. Um, and it touches on so much of the, the work that we do, not necessarily directly related to what we would think would be um, clinical services. It's that broader approach and it's looking at ways that we can um, reduce those health inequalities and looking at the impact um, of, um, of different factors across the uh, across rupture uh, that would impact on them and also our role in promoting health and well-being across across Shropshire and coordinating and attempting to rally those different organisations represented at the board to that aim. Um, you'll see in the paper that we've listed um, the uh, the attendees, the board members. So some of those are voting members. They're principally um, in effect the statutory partners, which is the um, the health and well-being board is the uh, the local authority members, um, the members from the CCG um, and Health Watch as a uh, as a statutory voting partner and also uh, a representative from the voluntary community sector. Um, not every health and wellbeing board has a voting member from the VCSA, but in Shropshire we do and we felt that was very important from the very start. So um, the um, the, the broad actions and the approach that we take in the Health and Wellbeing Board um, is based both on our governance and also guided by our statutory duties. So um, we have a number of statutory duties. They're not exhaustive, but the principle is that we're required to produce a joint strategic needs assessment, which is undertaken by public health. Um, that the the um, that uh, seeks to identify health needs across the Shropshire population, and the ambition there is to use that to inform and guide and prioritise our commissioning of services. We're required to produce a health and wellbeing strategy, and our strategy for 2021 to 26 is currently under development. Uh, you'll be hearing a little later more detail from Tanya Miles around the Better Care Fund, but the the Health and Wellbeing Board, the Health and Wellbeing Board, has a a central role in the commissioning and service delivery of the Better Care Fund. We're required to produce a pharmaceutical needs assessment, and that comes through, and that is um, that's part of a required function for the Health and Wellbeing Board. We're also required, I think. Uh, from a children's and adults perspective for their individual safeguarding reports to come through us through us on an annual basis 
and we also have um, uh, reports come through us around um, health protection issues and immunisation um, progress. So the way that the board actually attempts to uh, discharge these ambitions is through a number of subgroups. Um, we've detailed those individual subgroups. The principal preventative subgroup is Healthy Lives. That um, uh, works through a number of different areas, which you'll see in the um, in the table on page 10. Some of that um, has been certainly in Shropshire very innovative. So our work on social prescribing, um, we've led in the region on social prescribing. Um, our officer leading that is the uh, the chair for the West Midlands region of the social prescribing network. And now as social prescribing has emerged as a responsibility for primary care networks, uh, Shropshire really did hit the ground running in terms of the approach and the work that we've done around that. Um, you'll see there there's a number of other uh, work streams around carers, physical activity, mental health um, and the others that are listed there. I'd like to um, particularly highlight food poverty, although not uh, generally considered to be uh, a, a health issue. Um, when you're looking at the wider determinants of health, we're well served in Shropshire with a food poverty alliance and uh, we have been seeking to both promote, publicise and challenge some of the work undertaken by the Food Poverty Alliance and to raise awareness in Shropshire. And so we've had a number of reports from them coming into the Health and Wellbeing Board. Um, we integrate well across adults, uh, uh, adults uh, services and also children's social services. And you'll see there the work that we do um, in conjunction with the Children's Trust and the Family Carers Partnership Board. Um, post COVID, um, the Health and Wellbeing Board now um, integrates and has a subgroup of the Shropshire Local Outbreak Engagement Board. Um, that's chaired by my colleague, Councillor Dean Carroll. Um, and you'll see there in Section E uh, the role and significant job that that engagement board has in terms of um, working to coordinate our approach um, in the wider communities. Um, I think in conclusion, there's a couple of things I'd just like to say. Um, one is that uh, you'll see at our conclusion, we say that our role, other than in the case of the um, Better Care Fund, is not to specifically commission. So we uh, recommend um, activity that might be undertaken by our commissioning partners. Um, and we we don't have the power to instruct services to change. But what we do have is we have the opportunity to uh, show up a mirror um, to those uh, services and um, organisations that we work with and also for us to challenge. Um, and in that respect, I think that probably one of the biggest weaknesses, and it is a weakness and we've seen over the years um, the chair of your committee used to chair our health and wellbeing board and she'll be very familiar with the principal weakness of the health and wellbeing board is that in order for it to be successful, it needs and uh, it needs the positive engagement and um, willingness of all of the partners um, sitting around the table to make the best use of the opportunity that the Health and Wellbeing Board represents. And uh, we're fortunate now uh, to have um, good working relationships with the Clinical Commissioning Group. Um, sadly, looking back over it's now quite a few years ago, that hasn't always been the case. But I'm pleased to say that um, at the moment, um, certainly pre-COVID, we, we did some um, extremely helpful um, workshops. Uh, and I think that the, um, the Health and Wellbeing Board in Shropshire is in rude health um, and we continue to, um, to work to strive to improve um, the health and wellbeing for all of our citizens. Thank you. Thank you, Lee. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll jump in. Um, uh, yes, I am aware of uh, the, the, the vagaries and the fragilities of the Health and Wellbeing Board in the past. So am I to assume then um, from your last statement that your co-chair is now an active co-chair rather than a sleeping co-chair? Um, well, would it surprise you if I told you that he chaired the last meeting? Excellent. 
Well, there we go. <laughs> I'm very pleased to hear that because that was always um, an anomaly. I always thought that you had a kosher who wasn't willing to be a kosher. So I'm very, very pleased to, to hear that. Um, also, now, can I just focus in on some of the, the where you started off um, the presentation around the JSNA? Yep. Again, that's always been a, a point of, I think, weakness uh, within Shropshire. And there, it has been held up for criticism in that it's rather thin if you look at other um, JSNAs. Now, that could just be said that some of the partners or some of the criti critics want to be spoon fed because all, all our JSNA is, is is quite literally a series of links to data and other documents. There's no narrative um, around it. Um, my thought is, as I say, I, I'm I'm open on this because, you know, I, I do sometimes think there is an, an element of people or uh, areas wanting to be spoon fed the information rather than putting that work in themselves. But I'm wondering whose responsibility is it to write that narrative? Um, I think that the Health and Wellbeing Board in its wider context should be looking for that narrative to be there. Um, I don't think that it is uh, directly attributable to uh, public health itself because I think the uh, the benefit that a joint strategic needs assessment and the data per se is really only relevant if the context is um, sat alongside it. And so, um, you know, we had a um, uh, we, we had some questions at another scrutiny um, around our performance portal only last week. And I think, uh, you, you know, the uh, the person who asked the question was quite right to highlight that uh, on our performance portal, we've got some data that doesn't actually have either a green arrow or a red arrow on it. And so there's no indication as to whether or not a particular number is good or bad. Um, and that's absolutely right. And so, um, you know, I I regret on one hand that the joint strategic needs assessment isn't where it where it should be. Um, but certainly part of the ambition when um, when Rachel joined us as our DPH was that um, her background and particularly her ambition around the JSNA uh means that we it is an area that we intend to build on and something that we very much think should be at the heart of identifying health inequalities and need across Shropshire but we're a long way off being there just yet and I think um what if nothing else unfortunately um Covid has considerably um taken away from some of the resources that we might have been able to bring to bear on that can I just ask a few more questions around this, Lee? When did the board last discuss the JSNA? Um, I think pre-COVID. OK. And so um, if it did discuss it, what were the recommendations that it made? Were there, is there any I idea of a time frame of when it should be completed? And also, did it, did it discuss what resources should be put in place to allow it to be completed? Um, I, we didn't. We certainly did not discuss specifics around resources requiring completion. Um, we talked, I think, in broad terms around a time frame, but I think that we could largely say that um, any commitments to time frame made pre-COVID will now, I think, largely be um, out of time. Um, we 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 have certainly agreed um, the establishment of a working subgroup. Um, across the system to look at um, how we uh, progress uh, the full uh, joint strategic needs assessment and certainly my ambition and an ambition that we have discussed um, is for us to look at uh, a uh, sub regionalizing the uh, the data into uh, in an ideal world and clearly this isn't something that's going to be delivered anytime shortly but uh, uh, looking at uh, integrating the joint strategic needs assessment with um, economic data and basing that around the place plans in Shropshire, because um, I think that if we're to understand uh, the needs of our communities, we need to be much more specific about how that's orientated. Clearly, for some larger health systems, um, that wouldn't be appropriate, but um, we do think that, particularly when you're looking at 
um, primary care networks and um, primary care having the ability to uh, break that data down um, we think will, is going to be very valuable. Yes, I can understand the, the value in, in having that granular um, data, but in the meantime, we still have got no narrative behind the JSNA. And, and the JSNA is not a, a document set in stone, is it? It is meant to evolve and grow as the population changes and the population needs change. And so presumably that narrative would also change. And it just feels as though I could be wrong, but it just feels as though at the moment we're just stuck and everything is just being put behind COVID, behind COVID, behind COVID. I'm wondering, are there any other, other resources within the local authority that you could use to start the narrative, to get this going? Um, I understand the greater detail that you want to add and the layering and the complexity of that layering, but it all seems to me you've got this working subgroup. I don't quite know what they're doing. Is Tom Dodd's team um, involved in any? of this? Um, I am um, I'm aware that Tom Dodds has done um, some work around um, uh, performance and some of the work uh, contributing to this, but I don't have um, I don't have the detail as to exactly how the resource is allocated. OK, I've got a couple of people who've, who've come in. I'd like to continue this this sort of this line just a little bit longer, but I just want to catch up with some people who've asked to speak. Um, Dean, I'm going to allow Kate um, Halliday to come in next and I'll bring you in afterwards if that's OK. So, Kate. Uh, thanks, Chair, um, and I'm really pleased to hear these discussions about the, uh, the JSNA. Um, back in before 2012, certainly my sector, which is uh, drug and alcohol, used to produce their own, you know, nearly a hundred page document on drugs and alcohol alone, um, which included the sorts of information that um, Councillor Chapman was just discussing about sort of looking at, um, you know, really homing in on specific areas and deprivation. So. I have to say I'm really pleased to hear those discussions and also I'd like to see <coughs> the chair of this group in uh, scrutinising exactly what is happening in terms of the uh, current um, uh, looking at data. I mean there's an awful lot of data out there now, you know, it's very impressive isn't it, but I'm sure some part of this is down to resources but this is such an important area to get right because if we if we don't know what's happening out there, then we throw money away at resources that, that aren't needed. Um, uh, so I would support our chair in her request for a bit more information about how we're progressing this. Um, I'd also just on another just a sort of general comment, I, I do welcome the briefing paper we got, you know, and, and the candor involved in that. And, you know, I was really disappointed in the last uh, JSNA and just the kind of skimpiness of information and it's good to see a kind of a, a good look at that and also and this isn't something we can necessarily address but the confusion of the governance um, and again Councillor Chapman I welcome your you know honest appraisal of the situation in terms of the health and wellbeing board and the, and the complexities around that I took a look at the diagram that tried to explain the, the, the governance and it is so <laughs> very, very confusing. But my concern is that we end up in a situation where we don't know who is responsible for what. And, as, and, and this has been the perfect description here of who's responsible for the, the JSNA. Um, and so anything that can increase our understanding or at least have some sort of joint ownership of, of, of governance of these crucial um, these crucial actions would be really welcome. Thank you Kate. Um, I'm going to bring in Dean Carroll and then um, Mad Shineton and Lee then you can come back in if you want to answer any of the points raised. Dean. Thank you Chair. Thank you, Chair. Um, it's just briefly to point out an error in appendix two when it issue when it gives the names of the members of the outbreak engagement board it has missed off your vice chair councillor shinton who is also a member of the board excellent thank you at <coughs> uh, match mute 
Yes, I see one of the subgroups is the local pharmacy committee. Um, I've got some problems, uh, whether they're local or whether they're more widely spread, I can't tell you, but uh, I meet with a, a group of friends who are all over 80, so you can imagine the medication that uh, they're receiving. What doesn't seem to happen is once they have had a course of medication and it ceases, whether it's from a consultant or the GP, whichever, um, we don't seem to be able to get that item off the prescription. So one of my uh, colleagues has 40 packs of eye drops which she doesn't use. She's spoken to the pharmacy, she's spoken to the GP and she's been unable to disengage that. What, what can we do about that? Is there anything? I mean, that is such a waste of money. I'm looking um, to Lee. Uh, I'm, I'm presuming that um, we've not yet been joined by Rachel. Uh, is that a question that you want to feel to Rachel, Lee? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, not at all. I'm, 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 I'm happy to respond to um, uh, to Councillor Shinton's challenge around um, pharmacy. Um, I, I don't think that the Health and Wellbeing Board has a representative from the mm. Pharmaceutical Committee. So uh, um, with respect to Councillor Shanton, I'm not quite sure where the linkage is. However, um, the... Um, it's on your subgroup, Lee. The diagram, uh, five subgroups, Healthy Lives, and you've got a lovely little diagram there. And I noticed that one of the links is local pharmacy oh, committee, pharmacy which is committee. why I've asked the question. Absolutely. Right. OK, no, that is excellent. So I, I okay. wasn't challenging so you. I've no, 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 it's absolutely fine. Yes, I should read my own paper, shouldn't I? Um, so I, I don't I've not had any direct engagement with the local pharmacy committee. However, as a um, as a fairly regular attendee at the primary care commissioning committee, which the Health and Wellbeing Board has observer status on, and uh, I, I know from experience that you attend. Um, I think that the only approach that's likely to be able to uh, uh, tackle this is through the Primary Care Commissioning Committee because the uh, medicines management lead for NHSE or I or whatever they're called now um, is, uh, is present at the uh, Primary Care Commissioning Committee. And I think that until the um, until there's a coordinated approach across primary care for the um, for these issues around pharmaceutical supply from a medicines management point of view, I can't see it getting resolved. But I'd be happy if there was an organisation capable of bringing a paper that highlights this particular issue. We could um, we could highlight it at the Health and Wellbeing Board or. Um, perhaps there's a role for um, joint HOSC who perhaps might have teeth into the local pharmacy committee, but we, we, I'm fairly certain that we don't from a health and wellbeing board point of view. Hmm. I'm not sure that our teeth are uh, much sharper than, than, than yours at times. Um, <laughs> um, you know, I think the joint HOSC has slightly sharpened fangs, but um, ours are rather rounded molars. Um, talking about dental services here, shouldn't um, I? I um, I, I will chair um, uh, respond in part to um, some of the things that uh, Councillor Halliday brought up. Please um, do. Um, I think um, I think the governance. I think the governance is 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 interesting. Um, I'm not sure that um, I would describe it as confused. I, I have seen some diagrams uh, tabled elsewhere in the um, health uh, health economy that make ours look um, fairly straightforward. Um, I think I think the challenge with the Health and Wellbeing Board is that both the CCG's board and Shropshire Council's cabinet are the only responsible executives capable of making um, decisions in respect of um, uh, in respect of ultimately governance and, and decisions. There is a forum that um, with the uh, the joint commissioning board that works to coordinate commissioning activities across the health and social care economy. Um, but ultimately, um, the the health and wellbeing board remains challenged by the imposition of, 
and I use the word very deliberately, by the imposition of um, S the STP. Um, when the STPs were originally envisaged and brought in by government, they were an attempt to corral a number of healthcare providers and healthcare commissioners to simplify and uh, bring together um, and improve uh, the outcomes in local health and social care systems. They neglected to take very much consideration of existing health and wellbeing boards and um, we have I think now reached a, um, a reasonable working um, relationship. Um, we, uh, we, we, we work well and you'll see from um, the uh, you'll see from the one table um, that we are starting to align activities and responsibilities across the STP as a wider footprint as distinct from the Health and Wellbeing Board. But until primary legislation comes in that removes the responsibility from Shropshire, from Telford and Reakin and from Shropshire of having our own distinct health and wellbeing boards, um, then the the ongoing um, challenge of having um, a, a still somewhat disparate system, I think, will continue. Um, but I would I would emphasize that um, there is now a very considerable degree of um, of uh, coordinated work carrying on both across the STP um, and across the two health and wellbeing boards. And I think um, we've demonstrated in the past with uh, Telford and Reakin uh, uh, a willingness and an approach to work uh, jointly on a number of um, a number of aspects. Uh, not least of which our suicide prevention um, group, um, the work around uh, the mental health partnership board and our suicide prevention that's been done across uh, across Shropshire, Telford and Reakin. And um, I do think that um, as uh, we're now um, going to be having one CCG um, operationally already and um, uh, in legislation, I think at some point, um, I think the commissioning of health and social care uh, services will further be streamlined and simplified. But um, uh, it's never been easy. Um, and I think anyone wanting to somehow come up with a magic solution that is going to make any of this stuff easier um, is, is generally misguided because it's always been complex and difficult and the sums of money are huge. Yes, no, no I, I don't think anybody is, is suggesting that it, there's a simple solution to this. If we had a simple solution, um, you know, <laughs> we'd, be, we'd all be, you know, singing um, from the top, from the hilltops. However, um, Lee, I think what you've just said uh, really, really underlines the importance of having a completed JSNA in terms of this single commissioning and actually more integrated commissioning. You have to be able to do that with the evidence um, supplied by the JSNA. Um, would you agree? I, I absolutely agree and the uh, the commitment to progress uh, with uh, a JSNA and for us to build on that is undiminished um, and uh, I'm certainly I'm certain that if Rachel were here she would she would echo uh, she would echo that ambition and that commitment to um, uh, to continue the work. Mm. One of the um, um, areas that, that, that was sort of a little bit of research was done was actually how other health and wellbeing boards are, are evolving, if you like, around this single um, commissioning and integrated commissioning board. Um, have there been any conversations or discussions about moving um, down that line for the health and wellbeing board? Our health and wellbeing board, basically the commissioning just focuses on the BCF and the IBCF, doesn't it? It doesn't have any other function than that. That that is absolutely correct. Um, I think the um, I think it's always been a I think it's always been a question of sovereignty. Mm -hmm. um, I, I touched earlier on the fact that um, the accountability for uh, spending um, rests with Shropshire Council and with the CCG beyond the fund that is required to be delegated to the BCF for commissioning through the Health and Wellbeing Board. I think the problem in a system that is still stressed and I think we'd be um, we'd be fooling ourselves if 
we didn't consider the budget in Shropshire Council as being stressed. We know that the budget in the clinical commissioning group is under very considerable pressure. Um, the problem is that in order for us to move to a larger pooled budget beyond the requirements of the of the um, BCF requires, um, uh, I mean, a leap of faith is the wrong term, but it requires a release of sovereignty over those funds. Um, and so what I think we've seen um, in certain posts and certain activities across the system, we've seen jointly commissioned posts um, and we've seen jointly commissioned pieces of discrete work. And those have those have happened because the individual organisations have seen the individual uh, business case for that piece of work. I think to move to a situation where a an amount of money, a chunk of money was in effect delegated into a pooled pot, um, I can't see happening under a scenario where both sides of the system are so stressed financially. But I, I, I would share your view uh, that that would be a much better place to be working from. But um, in the short term, certainly I can't see that being um, in prospect. Mm. Um, thank you for that that candid response, Lee. Um, I've got Kate, uh, Kate Halliday who wants to speak again. Simon, you've come up and said that you want an update on the Brosley project. But I think that can come on the next paper. So Kate. Yeah. Um, Thanks for that response uh, to, to my question. Um, I It has never been easy, but I think since the 2012 reforms, most people would say it's got a lot more difficult because of the spinning off of various groups and um, the ever decreasing uh, levels of responsibilities. Um, to an overall structure, uh, but we can we can agree to we can agree to disagree on that one. Um, mine was just a really small point on the report. Um, I noticed that alcohol is a priority, um, although it didn't actually turn up in the um, healthy lives key programs. And and this is a small and important point. But I noticed that the, the use of the word alcoholism. Um, which isn't a, a medical term or a term um, that's probably best used within uh, reports. Um, uh, alcohol problems, alcohol dependence might be might be a better use of words. I'd, I'd certainly agree with you about the, am I muted or can you hear me okay? No, we can hear you, Lee. I, uh, uh, I'd agree with you about alcoholism. You won't have heard me. Um, you won't have heard me use that um, term. Um, alcohol dependency, um, substance misuse, um, absolutely. And I think that um, uh, you're absolutely right to point out the difference um, uh, of the JSNA in terms of some of the uh, drug and alcohol JSNAs that we've presented in the past. Um, and I think that, um, that that work is continues to be a priority and we need to continue to press for that to be um, for that to be done. Thank you. Thank you, um, Lee. I, can I just before we, we round this one up, um, uh, ask a few more questions? I've got a couple of other speakers as well. I just want to one of the areas that we're looking at going into, Lee, is uh, is mental health. In, in future uh, with the joint um, scrutiny. Um, and I'm just wondering in regards to the um, the JSNA, what oversight has the um, the Health and Wellbeing Board had into the, um, the development of the JSNA for children and for children with SEND? Um, well, I think oversight would probably be um, uh, because of its um, linkage with the word scrutiny, um, mm -hmm. I think oversight would probably be um, a step further than we um, than we have had. But what I will share is that um, you will you will be aware and colleagues will be aware that over the period of my time in the chair, we have um, continued to press for uh, improvements in uh, mental health services across Shropshire. 
Um, we've done this not quite in the same way that um, that a scrutiny committee would, but we have um, asked for reports both from the providers and from the commissioners um, around uh, mental health services. Mm -hmm. And we've taken the opportunity when those have come uh, into question, both in terms of their delivery, um, to highlight as we to, to provide a um, highlight of the failings of those. Um, that being said, I think that the work that's been done by our own team in public health, um, particularly around um, suicide prevention and the uh, mental health strategy, I think was um, extremely uh, well done and I think has really demonstrated the ability for us to coordinate um, an approach and to bring together um, a really good uh, strategy and for us to build on that. Unfortunately, what is beyond our uh, ability, as I reflected earlier, is uh, we do not have the ability to instruct organisations to commission in support of that. All we can um, do regrettably is uh, get partners to agree that a strategic joined up approach is uh, is the best way to go and for us to continue to have reports on progress to that brought back to the board. Um, I think that the um, the failings certainly in some um, of our um, health colleagues around um, SEND mm -hmm. have been highlighted. Um, they've been highlighted by external um, organisations at um, inspection and uh, we have not shied away from uh, bringing issues uh, around coordinating the approach to SEND into um, into the Health and Wellbeing Board. Um, we've we've often been criticised of being a uh, of only featuring adult social care priorities in the Health and Wellbeing Board, but certainly with uh, fellow cabinet members in children's services, we've tried very hard to rebalance that, and we have featured um, uh, items on. Um, SEND on on a number of occasions and certainly I remain very frustrated that uh, the approach um, to uh, children with um, an EHCP has still not resulted in them being able to have a, uh, a coordinated health and care budget to enable them to have a genuinely personalised service and um, I've not been backward in coming forward when I've had the opportunity to press partners to deliver that. Um, but, uh, you know, our I think I think we're in we're in a good position to get um, all of the decision makers in a room. Mm. Uh, to what extent we can actually force their hand when it comes to writing the checks, of course, is um, is is somewhat different. Yes, that, that's always been the problem though, hasn't it, Lee? I mean, I know that this issue was raised well, five or six years ago and yeah. everybody around the table sat there nodding. Um, but, uh, you know, so, you know, five years later, we now have this um, rather damaging um, and critical um, report of, of uh, elements of that service um, provided to our young people. Um, I wonder, is there... Um, is there more that the Health and Wellbeing Board can do now that you, you're reassuring us that the relationship with the CCG, um, you know, is 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 on track and and is improving? Um, is there more reassurance that you can give us around actually the resourcing of some of the elements that were criticised by the report? Well, I think what I can do is reassure you that the um, the Health and Wellbeing Board will continue to prioritise. Um, uh, those issues that arise as being uh, not only most important, but also those where we think action is required um, uh, more promptly, um, and and that type of those type of issues highlighted by those inspections would absolutely fall into that category. Uh, what what I'm what I'm less confident about is the ability to command resources mm -hmm. um, because. Um, uh, you know, it is, uh, you know, we can uh, we can demonstrate best practice, we can evidence the need, um, we can share and uh, pull together a strategy that we as a uh, as a health and wellbeing board all buy into. 
but ultimately the individual organization have sovereignty over their funds and their ultimately their decision making um falls down to that i think i think there's a i think the key to it has always been the joint commissioning board and the work that's done jointly um and certainly um i've been an advocate and we have had uh, occasions uh, and we continue to have posts that are jointly funded across the system um i think that uh, having a jointly funded shared post for some of these um, areas is much more valuable and I think would allow the separate organisations to have a better understanding of the need to resource them more fully um, because in effect they're not being told by an officer from another organisation to put their hands in their pocket. Um, so I think I think joint funding of posts and looking more strategically at joint funding needs to take place and in the health and well-being board we will continue to press and challenge um what i what i what i would be reluctant to guarantee is that resources will follow that but we'll certainly continue as we have done um to uh to reflect and to challenge the system so can i take that then as a sort of a, as a commitment to um future um commissioning subgroups looking at commissioning children some of children's services for instance um well I, i'd be um i'd be interested in speaking to the cabinet member for children's services to understand how the uh, health and well-being board can contribute towards um, improved outcomes in those areas and yeah. certainly um, I uh, I was on a, um, a call this morning with um, uh, with Ed Potter and uh, we continue to coordinate our activity to best effect and we, we, we would absolutely want to um, uh, to provide that opportunity. Yeah, I, I, I don't know if I'm being rather simplistic, but it, it would, you know, maybe had this sort of taken place sooner, some of the issues that were raised as in the critical um, report around um, SEND might have been averted or they could have worked, been worked through. But again, that might be just me being oversimplistic. I've got um, Heather Kidd who wants to come in and speak. Heather. Um what I want to raise is something similar, but uh, on a, with, with different organisations. And I've joined. I did actually raise this at Joint Hosk um, when we were talking in a, um, a sort of private meeting with mental health. Mental health do not coordinate with drugs and alcohol abuse, and m many people resort to drugs and alcohol because they haven't actually got good mental health and they're not getting the services they require and again this is about people working together and I understand completely from all sorts of things you've said this morning that you can't force anyone to do this but quite frankly just treating drug abuse or alcohol abuse without treating the underlying mental issues will just mean that eventually the, um, any treatment that's put in place for, say, alcohol abuse will just return because the mental health issues haven't been tackled. Uh, and they said, oh, yes, yes, we ought to be doing this. But there was no confirmation that anybody would actually look at this. And I understand that it's all sorts of different streams. Yet again, just as we've got with children's mental health and so on and the issues that we have around that. But unless we begin to tackle that, and certainly COVID has made this a lot worse because alcohol consumption has gone up. Um, but the mental health team will not look at somebody who is drunk, for instance, they immediately say, no, no, they're self-medicating and walk away. And I really think this should be an area that the um, health and wellbeing board look at because it then will impact eventually on casualty and all sorts of other areas that actually we do oversee. Um. I agree, Heather. Um, I it, it's always been a it's always been a source of uh, challenge and a recurring theme at health and wellbeing boards that the um, the clinical commissioning of mental health services have consistently been pathways driven 
and require a uh, a number of gateways in order for people to qualify for support what we're not seeing uh and you know to be honest we were doing it we started doing it in adult social care you know six years ago is taking the approach that people need support earlier on in their journey and so the preventative approach to uh, low level mental health services needs to be vastly improved and we need to see a shift in resources away from uh, acute support or we need to in some instances duplicate that support that that resource so that we can put more energy into preventative services um, uh, Shropshire Council, um, through our social work teams, uh, now and have have for some considerable period done um, informal Let's Talk Mental Health drop-ins, which we've um, used as a way of outreach. But they don't they don't address the core issue um, that you highlight in relation to someone who is already using alcohol, for example, and then being in effect uh excluded from service so um uh, if i can um uh, i i agree that it's an area that we should uh, again be uh looking at and um i would happily um take that away and uh look at ways that we could bring that to the health and wellbeing board um thank you um yes please um rachel you wanted to come in welcome rachel Thank you. Apologies for, for being late um, uh, uh, today. Just just to add to that, um, Chair, if I can. So uh, you're absolutely right. Um, we are updating our drug and alcohol strategy at, th at this current time, and it's due to come to the Health and Wellbeing Board. It has been, it was delayed because of COVID, but I think it's due to come possibly to the next Health and Wellbeing Board or the one after uh, the consultation document on the strategy. And, and that is one of the issues that we're keen to address within that and make sure that as that we do tie those up and as um, as uh, Councillor Chapman's just said, you know, that importance of prevention, getting to people early, that multi-agency working, where we, we know we've had issues around that before, is key. And we've and, and the strategies engaged with local stakeholders, so we, we need to make sure we absolutely do capture some of that. So just to, to give some reassurance that we, that is being addressed, is being considered, and we will be we will take that through that channel as well. Um Thank, thank you for, for that, Rachel, for that um, assurance. I, I think, you know, we're sort of working our way to a couple of recommendations here, but can I just go back to the commissioning subgroup? Um, what does it actually commission and, and what commission has it looked at um, recently? I'm trying to understand, get a better understanding of just, yes, we know about the BCF and the IBCF, but what else has it done? And you've also mentioned, Lee, that it looked at, you know, joint positions, funding joint positions between um, the local authority and the CCG. But what else does it actually do? Uh, OK, well, I'll come in first. Um, I think that the role of the Joint Commissioning Group is to look at um, opportunities and to progress areas where there is a shared ambition to uh, commission services across the CCG and uh, the uh, local authority. So I know that some of the work's been done around um, uh, hospital discharge, um, some of the work done around um, two carers in a car, um, some of the um, some of the transformation work that we did in adult social care went through the joint commissioning board. Some of that um, has been taken up jointly. Some of it hasn't. Um, there's a number of um, different uh, programs um, that have uh, that have come into that, and that's that's part of the work of that board. It's it's seeking opportunities where. Um, both organisations would want to uh, progress a particular area and commission it. Mm. Yes, thanks for that, Lee. I mean, I know both all of those that you just mentioned there are coming up in the on the next agenda item. I think they do fit in quite well together, um, the, the, these two items, and there will be a degree of overlap. Rachel, you, you want to come in and comment on that? Yeah, again, it was it was just to add to that. So it's as you said, it's not that it actually commissions and has a budget that board itself to commission. It's about that joining up of the CCG and, and other partners. Um, and some examples from public health, the social prescribing work has gone has been taken through that group 
as well. So that, that joining up, making sure that all partners are involved and, and the direction is joined up and often then um, they can have more detail working outside of those meetings. So it's uh, it's about making sure that we have the right vision strategy and that's and that's been brought together. It's that wider and that wider preventative work as well has gone through there. So not just focusing on um, sort of the community work, but actually focusing on that wider community well-being has been picked up through that group in that vision. So um, yeah. again, joint force. So just to add to that from a public health perspective as well. Thank you. I've just lost my chats. Um, yes, here we are. Um, um, so th thank you uh, for that contribution, um, Rachel. Um, I'm just, as I said before, I think we're working towards, um, the time is, uh, is there for us to work towards some recommendations. And um, I think um, we need to sort of um, be firm in, in what we're asking. Rachel, before you joined us, there was a lot of discussion around the JSNA and um, uh, and and you know uh, what what is lacking in the JSNA at the moment. I think um, I would like to ask uh, members if they would agree that we would like a resourced, a clear resource plan uh, around the the JSNA to come back to us. Um, maybe January, um, if that would be possible. Um, and also, I think we'd like to look a little bit more in, de in detail around the, um, the commissioning subgroup and the work that they're doing. I don't know how members feel about that. Um, I think yes, I'd agree with that, Karen. It just seems to me that one of the things the COVID epidemic has uh, thrown up is the importance of the people and whatever discipline, whatever the label is, actually working together. And it seems to me that this is an opportunity for us to bring some of those dots and join them together uh, for the better, for the future. Yeah. OK, um, so I'm, I, I'm, I've got those, those, that, that recommendation. Um, uh, are there any other points that you want to come back on? I'm sorry, I'm just looking at my briefing notes. I've just suddenly realised I have them and I haven't been following them exactly. So apologies. Um, Rachel, Lee, are there any other points that you'd like to um, clarify or add? Uh, no, uh, not from my perspective. Um, I think it's been very helpful. Um, and uh, certainly some of the issues that members have highlighted, I think, are uh, both uh, work that's already in hand, but I think also um, emphasises some of the work that we have done. I think probably, Chair, I would um, I would probably take the counter view to you in respect to the uh, the result of the SND inspection, because uh, in the Health and Wellbeing Board we actually highlighted the problems um, before the inspection. Mm -hmm. um, it's a, it's of regret that our highlighting it didn't result in a change of behaviours. But I think it does show the uh, the benefit, um, albeit not always successful, um, of bringing the issues and highlighting them in the Health and Wellbeing Board. So, yes, yeah, so I thank members for their time. I haven't got anything else to add. Thank you. I wasn't being critical, um, Lee. I was just highlighting the fact that this had been raised over the yeah. years and yet still no absolutely. action had been taken. No, absolutely. Absolutely. Mm. OK, um, so I'm just going to run through. We have um, I'm going to two recommendations. They're in a loose format at the moment, but I'm I'm hoping that they will be sufficient to to give direction. Um, I think we would like to have a clear resource plan um, for uh, the SEND and uh, the main JSNA. Uh, to bring to the meeting. Sorry, look at the state of that to bring to the meeting in um, January. And also, uh, we'd like to look at the commissioning subgroup work um, program um, at the January meeting as well. We'll tie those two together for the January meeting. So I'm going to run through the members of the committee if they're happy. Car Car uh, Karen, sorry, could I just interrupt? Um, I, I, I'm completely clear about the issue around the Joint Commissioning Board and the JSNA. Mm -hmm. Could you just elaborate on what you're looking for in relation to the SEND? Yes, I suppose we're looking for what actions have been taken uh, and what, you know, how, how, how have the criticisms that were raised, how have they been actioned? OK, so report back following the inspection of SEND services. Yeah. OK, and that invite presumably will have to go to the CCG as well. Presumably. 
Karen, can I just sort of put a bit of extra emphasis on that? If actions have been taken, uh, can we know the results? In other words, were they a plus or were they a minus? Because it's all right to list, oh, we've done this, we've done that. I actually mm. want to know, well, did it do any good? Mm. So if we can include that, I'd be grateful. Okay. Uh, uh, Chair, if I'm if I may uh, interject here for a moment, I think uh, just I think there's a there's a risk here of, of things flying off to wrong committees. Um, the uh, people overview committee is actually looking at the send action plan uh, at, at its meeting in the middle of next week. So I would suggest I would suggest that if you wanted some sort of oversight around the work to support that work around. Um, children with a send, then you you might want to limit it to um, looking at the JSNA as you discussed earlier. Mm. Okay, I don't want to step on children's um, children's services or people's services toes and or duplicate or replicate or give any additional work that uh, is not required. Um, so. Yes, I think we'll we'll stick with Daniel's um, guidelines and uh, focus in around the send in the J the main JSNA. You know okay. what work has taken place there. Um, is that okay? okay? Thank you, Karen. I, yeah, I, I thank didn't you, realize, Karen. Is that? I, I must have. Yeah. I didn't realise that it was going to children's services. Oh, I might might have to go along to that one or, or click into that one to see how that's going. Um, all of this fits in uh, is really important to us, Lee, in terms of um, our future scrutiny work with mental health services as well. Um, so, it, you know, your your support um, would be invaluable and the information that you can provide, hopefully, around the resourcing um, equally um, as valuable. And yep. it, it just hopefully as well might give a little bit power to your elbow, if you like, in negotiating for those resources. Well, um, I'm, I'm, I'm very I'm very happy to um, advocate for uh, resources to be placed appropriately and there doesn't seem to be enough of that still. No, no, I agree. So I'm going to run through the, uh, the names of the committee uh, or if in fact, I think you have to do this, Amanda. No, I think that's for me to do, actually, Chair. Oh, right. OK, thank you. Sorry, Daniel. <laughs> so so we have two recommendations. One that we uh, that the uh, officers uh, bring back to the committee a clear resource plan for the uh, for, for the JSNA and for the send JSNA to come back to the committee meeting in January and to bring back a report uh, giving a more detailed overview of the Health and Wellbeing Boards Commission subgroup also to the January meeting. So um, I'll read through those now. Um, okay, Roy Oldcroft. Uh, yes, in favour. Okay, Karen Calder. Agree. Gerald Dakin. Agreed. Kate Halliday. Yes, I agree. Simon Harris. I agree. Tracy Hoffer. Yes, I agree. Simon Jones. Yes, I agree. Heather Kidd. I agree. Paul Milner. Yes, I agree. And Matt Shiton. Yes, I agree. Uh, that's a unanimous agreement, Chair. Well, thank you very much. Uh, we'll take those recommendations then. Um, uh, thank, can I thank uh, Lee? Um, for your uh, candid answers to um, some of the questions. Um, it's always helpful if we can get, you know, fairly straight answers. Um, and Rachel, are, are you staying for the for the next item as well? Or Lee, are you staying for the next item as well? Um, I'm, I, I shall I, I shall check with um, uh, Tanya about that. Um, and uh, yes, I, I shall either stay or not. But yeah, okay. um, happy, happy I to think, support. I think that's me, Karen, the next item. Okay. okay, so yeah. we've got Tanya here as well. Is she with us? Chair. Chair. Good morning, Chair and Committee. It's Tanya Mars here. I'm on my mobile phone. Slight technical problems this morning, so uh, okay. I am here. Good morning. Was somebody calling Chair? Uh, yes, uh, myself, Paul Milner. I've got no declarations of interest. I had trouble with IT, so I'm sorry I was late. OK, well, thank you for that, um, Paul, and welcome. Uh, we're now on to item seven, which is the Better Care, Improved Better Care Fund. Um, so, Tanya, um, are you going to be able to um, present or have we got Deborah 
So, um, so good morning, all. I've got I've got a presentation on my mobile phone. So I would like to welcome into this call as well Deborah Webster, who's our um, commissioning manager in adult social care, and also Patricia Blackstock, who is manager for the um, hospital and reablement services, who will be supporting me um, with the presentation. Um, so can I just check, Amanda, is the presentation um, on the screen for members? Uh, yes, it is. Wonderful. OK, so um, I'm going to make a start. So members would have received the paper in advance of today's committee. This is a very brief presentation, just highlighting um, key, key points from, from the paper. Um, so it's Tanya Myers. I'm the um, AD for Adult Social Care and Housing. Um, so the presentation overview, um, we will summarise the council's allocation of the Improved Better Care Fund and the projects implemented using the IBCS funds. We'll evidence the progress to date and we'll describe the impacts of the different projects which have been implemented using the IBCS. Next slide, Amanda. Uh, we want to share with committee the positive progress achieved to date in relation to the IBCS. We would like a conversation with committee about how we can support further representation to central government about the continuation of this funding. And then agree with committee how you want to receive further updates. Next slide, Amanda. So this is not the first time we've had a paper to, to this committee and I know this committee is um, really interested um, in the IBCS. Um, so you'll be aware that the IBCS is a government funded grant it is short term, time limited and is ring fenced and therefore does not change the council's underlying in funding gap. Although in 2021 is scheduled to be the final year of the grant scheme due to the government's focus on COVID-19 and therefore not on any changes to the government funding, um, we anticipate that the grant may be rolled over for a further year into 21-22. Next slide please Amanda. The IBCS grant provided the funds that enabled us to pilot a series of innovative schemes. We provided extra capacity in adult social care, we've reduced the pressure on the NHS and reduced detox, and we've ensured that the local service social care provider market has been supported. Next slide please Amanda. So during the life of the IBCS we piloted around 33 schemes. Um, which then reduced down to, to 26. Um, in 1920, the council funded 24 schemes, and there are now 13 schemes remaining. Next slide, Amanda. We've aligned our IBCS schemes to provide extra capacity of adult social care through increased numbers of social workers in the community social work teams, additional hours in our brokerage team, and dedicated continuing healthcare social workers and support to our mental health preventative work. We've reduced pressures on the NHS by increased capacity of social workers in A&E, hospital-based carers lead, additional social work capacity in the hospital social work team, increased capacity in our start reablement team and additional capacity um, into our discharge to assess nursing beds. We've ensured that the local social care market is supported um, by trialling and providing um, four independent care home assessors. And these assessors um, do assess on behalf of providers, preventing providers travelling around the county to do assessments for patients in hospital. Next slide, please, Amanda. So between 2017 and 18, there's been a reduction of 98% in delays transfers of care. And in January this year, our national ranking in relation to detox was eighth in the country out of 152 local authorities. Next slide, please, Amanda. So what can IBCS scheme do? Well, the grant fund enables us to pilot new schemes to evidence that they can have a positive impact on the lives of people in Shropshire as well as meeting the criteria for the grant and giving us value for money. And a really good example of this is our two carers in the car scheme that um, I'd like Deborah Webster now just to talk to committee about. 
Thanks, Tanya. Um, good, good morning, Chair. Good morning to the committee. Um, so, yeah, my name is Deborah Webster. I'm the um, Commissioning Manager for Adult Social Care. So talking to you a little bit more about the two carers in a car scheme. Um, I think it's helpful just to give a little bit of an overview of what the scheme is. It started with a, a question about what can we do to help people stay at home if they have nighttime care needs and reduce the need for residential care and um, for people to go into uh, care homes because they have some nighttime care needs and indeed for the um, sort of imposition and the, the overall cost of having somebody sit in the house all night um, because that was our only two options prior to this um, this scheme. So the, the essence of the scheme is exactly what it says on the tin. Um, two carers will travel um, around the area which is based around a market town. There are five of these contracts in the county um, and they will um, support people who have care needs at night. So what's happened with that scheme now is that um, we've evidenced that it is supporting people to stay at home rather than have to go into care. Um, it's really focused on outcomes for people so rather being a specific call at a specific time it's, it's focused on what that individual needs at that particular time of night and that can either be an emergency response to a short-term need or it can be um, a regular uh, call to a longer-term need. So it's helped people be less dependent, just the right amount of nighttime support rather than having somebody sitting there all night just in case. Um, we've seen evidence of less admissions into residential care and hospital. We've seen improvements in hospital discharges. It's been a great support to the emergency duty team and the out of hours GP service. Um, it's reduced pressures on ambulance services who were sometimes called when they weren't necessarily needed. Um, and I'll go on to show you a little bit more information about it being value for money. And it's also very importantly um, been a great partnership piece of work between the council, um, uh, our, our health colleagues and uh, social care provider partners as well. Could I have the next slide, please, Amanda? Thank you. Oh, sorry, could you just um, press the progress on that one? So um, during the pilot and the period afterwards, we've supported over 200 people. That's over three and a half thousand visits have happened. Um, and 25% of the people who've been supported have either been discharged from hospital or in fact have actually avoided admission into hospital in the first place. Um, and 40% of people um, have gone on to be self-supporting. So it's just been that right amount of support at the right time, perhaps after somebody comes out of hospital on a short term basis, just giving them that re-ablement support in, during the night, um, whereas they would perhaps have gone into care, become a little bit over reliant on there being too much care. Um, and it's just been enough to help people back up onto their feet after a hospital stay so that they've not needed um, care. Um, going forward, they've actually um, been able to, to manage for themselves. So we did a, a, a quality survey um, with people who have been a part of the service and um, that showed 100% satisfaction. We've had no complaints and no issues with that service, which has been really important. Could I have the next slide, please? Thank you very much. So of those 40%, those that's actually 65 people who've, who've no longer needed um, care been a lot of really positive outcomes for those individuals um, and that actually saved quite a lot of money for the council of just over 1.4 million um, pounds when you look at that um, what the cost of that care would have been um, projected forward to the end of the year and so for the people who've remained in the service um, savings compared to what the the cost of a um, the previous available service i.e residential care or a night sit has saved us a further 1.9 million so if we take off the cost of the contracts, because obviously there are costs associated with those contracts, the overall saving delivered by the two carers in a car contract since July of 2018 when it started is just over two and a half million pounds. So I'd just like to share with you and I'll just need to um, share a, a different screen if that's OK. Um, we've got a um, we've got a, a short video. Um, of a lady um, called Rhiannon. Um, can you just say, has that come up onto your screens? Yes, I, I can see Rhiannon and her dad's story. Okay, so I'm going to try playing this now and hopefully it will behave for me this morning. It was a short while ago. So just like to share Rhiannon's story with you, obviously with her permission.
uh, with no volume, with no sound. Sorry, Chair, did you say there was no sound? Yes. OK, I'll try that one more time. And if it doesn't work, rather than waste time, I'll just give you a little bit of a, a, a story. <coughs> Sorry, is anybody receiving that sound or video? Uh, no, I've got a still picture of Rhiannon and, uh, and no sound. OK. Is that working? Sorry. No. Deb, we can just talk to that story, please. Thank you. OK, um, I'll, I'll take that down and stop sharing that. If you could put the slides back up, apologies for, for That's that. That's OK. So um, Rhiannon tells us a story um, about um, how she's been a carer for her dad um, for quite a period of time and um, she'd had support with the care during the daytime but there wasn't support for, um, for her dad at night and she talks quite um, eloquently about the impact that that had on her and on her dad um, and on her dad's desire to stay at home and be independent um, and how ultimately for a long period of time she was having many calls through the night when her dad was anxious or needed some support so she because she was about 15 minutes away she'd have to get in the car and drive several times a night um, she talks um, very openly about coming to a point where she um, felt that she was having a breakdown herself. Um, she talks about getting out of her car um, one night on her way back on the side of the road and crying because she just feels felt like that she couldn't cope anymore. Um, and she felt that she had become her dad's carer um, and she wasn't a daughter anymore. So um, she talks about the social worker introducing her to the two carers in a car project. And um, she met the two ladies who um, were working there um, the area to support her dad and they came a couple of times a night um, and Rhiannon talks about the impact that that's had on her dad and how he feels so much more confident knowing that somebody's coming once or twice a night when he needs them um, and the impact on herself and the fact that she now feels that she can be a daughter rather than a carer um, and I think it was very um, kind and, and brave of her to share that story with us also really important to show that impact that um, schemes of this nature are actually having on people's lives. So sincere apologies, the, the video wouldn't work properly. I tried it many times this morning, it was working fine, but always the way when you want to show it. So apologies you couldn't see Rianne herself, but um, I think her, her story's a powerful one. Yes, thank you, um, Deborah. Um, can I, can I, before we go off the um, carers in a car, I think there's a, a couple of questions that, are, that members would like to ask. Um, Simon Harris has asked, how many towns is it, is it in now? It's actually in five now. Um, Which ones are they? Sorry, so it's, there's, there's two in Shrewsbury, north and south. Um, there's Ludlow and Oswestry and... Um, So I think it's it's very it's it's really been positive. I mean, one of the issues that we have had with it, it needs to have a certain number of people to be effective. So it actually hasn't been um, a possibility in some of our more rural areas. So we're looking for another solution in those. Okay, I've got um, Heather Kidd and Tracy Huffer who would like to ask a question on this. Heather. Well, I think Deborah, you've just answered my question. I mean, my concern is actually ambulances being called all over 200 square miles of southwest Shropshire um, which needn't be so I'd be really interested and I'm sure we as a committee would be really interested in seeing your solution to that because two carers in the ca a car will be an absolute must and um, people in rural areas tend not to call for an ambulance unless they're really desperate and to be able to head that off in such an area I mean, we if you look at our 200 square miles for Clun Division, Bishop's Castle and mine um, we have only just shy of 10,000 people so actually any solution is going to be interesting to say the very least 
but actually is a must because we don't get the ambulances and the ambulance response times and so on are poor as well and I'd much prefer our residents not to end up in A&E. Uh, absolutely, um, Councillor Kidd, thank you for the question. Um, yeah, one of the things that we have been looking at is the rural um, solution actually, the, the um, equivalent of two carers in a car for rural areas. So this winter we've got a plan in place that we're going to pilot actually for the southwest because we know that's an area of particular need. Um, some outreach services, we're going to, we've got um, some um, commissioning work to do with some providers and we're going to look at the conversations around outreach services from care homes and from extra care facilities in the area and potentially partnerships with some of our domiciliary care providers so that we can start to to create those more rural focused solutions. So the Southwest being an area of particular need is the place we're going to focus on first this winter. Um, will local members be in, uh, told how that's going to work as it's piloted? Because it would be really useful for us to know. That would be a really welcome conversation actually. We're going to have a um, conversation with some of the provider market to look at what's possible. You know, that sort of um, using their knowledge and experience as well as our own to, to look at what, what is possible and what we can do um, with them because we've got some good strong relationships with our provider partners and that would be a very welcome conversation with members. Councillor Kidd, thank you. Um, before I bring anybody, um, there's a couple of other people who, who are members who'd like to ask questions. Can I just ask a question? How do you determine and uh, understand what need there is in these very the remote and rural areas? And how do people refer, how are people referred into the service? The referrals for two carers in a car actually come from um, lots of places and I think that's been one of the contributing factors to its success. So um, referrals can come in obviously directly from social workers the way we would normally have referrals coming into services but they can also come in from GPs, from A&E, the ambulance service can refer in. Um, so we've got lots of different routes into, into that and that's that kind of um, having multiple referral routes to meet local needs would be something we'd be looking to replicate when we look at the rural solution. And how, how are you um, quantifying the need in the rural areas? How are you gathering that information to determine what kind of service you can commission? It, it's always difficult to know what's going to be needed in the future, isn't it? Is that mm -hmm. um, that mm -hmm. forecasting almost? But we we use a lots of um, data, um, demand analysis. Uh, sorry, demand analysis via um, A and E attendance. Um, we look at our own information that we've got, how many referrals we've had from similar areas in the future, and we can actually build good flexibilities into contracts with providers because they do understand that. So um, it's a um, it's a process of using all of that data and demand analysis and, and sort of feeding that in um, and making sure we've got some flexibility so that we can expand or contract those contracts when we need to. Mm. And can this uh, this service be, um, um, uh, can, can it be, uh, can, can people who are end of life and receiving palliative care, can they access this service? It has been used for that, yeah. Mm. OK, um, thank you very much for that, Deborah. I've got um, Tracy um, Puffer next. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, some some of the questions I had have been uh, rurality and, and questions around that have been answered. Another question is um, um, that, uh, um, sorry, I've lost my track of late, uh, my thought now. Um, yes, the, the carers. Are these um, actually qualified nurses and sort of what I know you, you've put that they can give um, assistance with falls and anxiety, but can you give a bit, a bit of a better understanding on actually what that uh, means? Um, can they, um, well, basically I want to know, are they qualified nurses or, or, or are they just like a carer that, um, uh, um, you know, a, a carer that would go in normally in the home or are they qualified to, to do other things, um, qualified nurse, etc. Thank you for the question. Yeah, the um, the carers are actually, they are carers rather than nurses, although some um, nurses do end up working on, on those shifts, but it's not a necessarily a 
prerequisite. They do tend to be much more experienced carers because mm -hmm. they te they have to work um, at night with a partner always, obviously never on their own. Um, but they so they and they do have a, a perhaps an enhanced level of training. I mean, all the carers would be required to make sure that they got all of their um, basic training so that they would know what to do in an emergency. Um, but they wouldn't. Um, the nursing qualification wouldn't be required for the job. OK. Sorry, Karen, can't unmute it. Just okay. another uh, question. Yeah. Um, how long can they get that? They go into someone's home for so do they go in one night? What if they required sort of for a week? Would they be able to do that? Or is it sort of like a one off um, visit or how long uh, it, it, sorry. are they able to do that for? Um, it can be both, actually. So we've seen situations where somebody's gone in, um, you know, for example, uh, somebody had um, problems with their, their catheter one night and um, there was just one time and the, the carers went in and um, supported that person and made them comfortable um, and they were not needed again. Um, but some people it's, it's on a long term basis, so they'll go in once a night, every night um, on a long term basis. So it's very flexible in that way. And we've actually found that's been really helpful, especially when people are coming out of hospital where they might need perhaps two or three calls a night to begin with and then that gradually tails off as they get a little bit more confident and they feel um, that they can manage by themselves and they're not needed as it goes forward so it's very much based on the outcome that that individual needs. And sorry just one final question the five areas that you cover so that's actually five cars with two people in each car they don't actually uh, cross over um, different border areas do they so it would just be five cars so in in effect two people to, to for five cars that's absolutely right yeah. yeah yeah that's that's all I need to know thank you um, I've got a uh, Simon Jones has asked can we be sent a copy of the video as we weren't able um, to actually see it if you could send that to members that would be helpful um, I've got Kate Halliday who would like to ask a question yeah thank you um, thanks for the presentation and the report and I'd just like to say the report is actually full of some innovative projects that look like they've been um, doing really good and I, I mean so, you know, it would be good if some of these could continue, but I do know the uh, uncertainty of, of what will happen next. Um, I was interested um, that th there's a bit of a mixture between health and social care, which is 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 very. Social care have an initiative. The savings don't always come direct to social care. They might um, be savings in the health system, and, and, and that has confused progression of projects um, in the future. So it was it was a little bit about that. Are the savings some of them direct to, to health rather than social care? Um, because I'm just wondering whether that could be a future way of, of, of continuing some of these. Uh, projects um, and I had a specific question on the um, D2A, the um, the project in the in the report, um, the the discharge from hospital project, and just a question on that: was that funding? You know, was the service um, a, a social care service um, providing the the beds, or was it a mixture of health and social care? Um, I can answer the question about the savings from the two carers in the car and then I'll pass on to, to colleagues to talk, talk a little bit more about the, the, the other part. But um, so the, um, the two carers in a car savings have been adult social care savings because we would normally have paid for the, those um, residential care beds or those night sits. So they have been directly to the adult social care budget. Um, there there will, will be some savings to health where people have been um, supported not to go into hospital, perhaps admission avoidance, that sort of thing. Those would be really difficult to quantify, to be honest, but there have been definite benefits to, to um, colleagues in health. Um, I think because of the success of the um, two carers in a car scheme and how it's worked and, and the savings that it's made, um, that actually um, IBCF money has enabled that to be proven successful and then go forward to be based in the adult social care budget so that the, the grant funding ceases to fund it and then the adult social care budget picks it up because it's actually 
um, of better value than the previous service that they were paying for. So I think that's that's been a really good example of how that works in terms of those savings and the future of of, of schemes of that nature. But I'll, I'll pass you on to the, um, the others to answer the other question, if that's OK. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Deborah. Who's coming in to answer? Chair, it's Tanya here. Can I please suggest that we carry on with the presentation a bit further because the dish data assess does come up a bit further on in the presentation. Okay, we can do that. Kate, come back in if, if uh, it's not answered your question exactly. Yeah, fine, thanks. So we're going to now move on to, to the current scheme that the IBCS is funded and Trish is going to uh, take us to the next slide. Slide 15. Thank you, Amanda. Tanya, could you just confirm which slide you need? Because I lost connectivity for a minute there. <laughs> slide 15, thank you. Mine don't have numbers on, so uh, the there's... One, it's, the one, it's the one after current schemes. OK, we're there, thank you. Thank you. Trish? Oh, I think we might have lost Trish, so I'll, I'll take this slide if that's OK. So we're on slide 15. So uh, the current... Apologies, can everyone hear me? Oh, there you are. Carry on, Trish. I'm so sorry, technical problems here. <laughs> OK, um, good morning, um, good morning, um, Chair, and good morning, committee members. My name's Trisha Blackstock, and I'm the service manager for the hospital team and enablement service. So I'd just like to take you through some of the IBS schemes that um, we've utilised to um, improve our capacity and our performance. Um, so this current slide takes you through um, one of the um, investments that we did where we increased social work capacity for these community social work teams. Now, prior to the investment, um, what we saw was um, increased um, waiting times, so people waiting for reassessments. So obviously that had implications in terms of um, meeting people's needs and also giving people the right kind of service they required. The increased capacity allowed us to undertake timely assessments. Um, so that meant people had sort of the right level of support they needed, were able to promote independence and there was a strong focus on improving individuals resilience which led to less dependency um, on the local authority. Can I have the next slide please? Next slide please. Okay, um, Deborah I think um, David's going to take us through the um, scheme relating to brokerage. Thank you very much. So the um the brokerage team are a, a team of, of people who support um, essentially getting packages of care at the right time as fast as possible um, to people who need care coming out of hospital or people in the community who need care. So um, they work with the market um, and uh, make sure that they um, broker that package of care. So um, essentially over the last three years, the demand for hospital discharges is, is um increased a great deal it's actually tripled um so that and there is a, a an expectation on the council from the government the nhs to obtain packages of care within 48 hours um, and since um covid has happened the expectation is that discharges take place on the same day um, and within three hours of somebody being fit for discharge so the the um expectation obviously of, of the, the speed at which somebody's discharged from hospital has increased a great deal. So um, one of our investments with IBCF um, money has been to create additional hours for the brokerage team so that they work on the weekends so that we've put additional capacity into the team to enable a weekend rotor to support those hospital discharges so that come a Monday morning we're not getting that massive backlog of people um, that, that need care very quickly and um, that people can actually be discharged across the weekend um, and that we're then working with the market to respond um, quickly um, to, to those needs when they when they're there. Sorry could we have the next slide please and I'll pass you back. OK, thanks very much. 
Um, so the next scheme that we're going to look at is the um, investment in dedicated um, social workers to contribute to the continuing healthcare assessment. And so that's the CHC post. So we had additional um, social workers that supported these health assessments. Um, importantly, um, these health assessments rely on evidence about the individual's personal circumstances and how their health condition impacts on them. Um, our social workers um, that were linked to this scheme were able to support and ensure that individuals who were eligible for CHC funding, that's continuing healthcare funding, were able to um, receive that support and also their care would have been funded um, via health. So that was really, really positive. Next slide, please. Sorry, it's the one previously, the um, increased mental health provision. Thank you. So prior to the uh, IVCF investment, um, we had community mental health social workers, but they weren't able to provide the, the level of intervention um, that um, we really needed. Now, the grant enabled us to um, have additional mental health social workers who were able to undertake preventative work in the community. Um, Importantly, um, they were able to work from mental health hubs, which provided greater opportunity for seamless joint working between our health partners and the third sectors. And this enabled us to have much better outcomes for those individuals um, who relied and needed that service and also um, ensured that, again, there was less reliance and dependence on adult social care because we prevented, we were able to prevent and reduce and delay the need for um, more formal services. Next slide, please. OK, so um, the next few slides talks about our um, investment in additional bed based capacity, so additional bed based provisions. So social care, the scheme enabled social care to um, commission additional beds to enable people to be discharged from hospital in a much more timely manner. Um, so they were able to continue with their rehabilitation in the most appropriate setting. Um, now it is minded that um, in terms of hospital discharges, the focus is always um, discharge home um, to support people at home if they require it. But we do know that there are a number of people that required um, ongoing support in a bed based provision. So our discharge to us uh, assess bed provides for that and the investment in IV IBCF um, allowed us to have 19 additional nursing beds. Next slide, please. Just one moment, Trish, if I may, just to answer um, Councillor Kate Halliday's question. So these 19 discharge to assess beds are currently funded um, through the Improved Better Care Fund. This is one of those schemes where through review, we will need a conversation with our health partners about the future funding of these beds. In other systems, it's, it's a mixed picture. So in other systems, um, the CCG and the Acute Trust um, pay for discharge to assess beds. Um, there's a joint agreement with some systems between the local authority and health. So this has been a, a great opportunity to, to increase our bed capacity, to enable people to leave hospital in a timely manner. Um, but there needs to be now a conversation and a further evaluation around the system impacts and the system benefits of these beds um, moving forward um, for future funding um, in 21-22. Thank you um, for, for that, um, Tanya. Can, would it be timely, actually? I've got a couple of members who've asked to speak. Would it be timely to have a couple more questions? Uh, and I've got one or two questions around the um, the D2A. Um, Madge, would, uh, Gerald, would you like to come in? I've got you down. Gerald Aiken. Thank, thank you, Chair. I think this, this is something that's really, really worked well. Um, transfer of care has been a problem for many years. This really seems to hit the nail on the head of how to provide it. Uh, but uh, as Kate Holliday said before, what's really going to happen if this fund is removed? It's it's apparently has got 12 months to run. Now, the from what I can see, the people who will benefit from this most would be the uh, the hospitals, the health. Um, 
Have we been in conversation with them to see what's going to happen um, if this is not continued by the uh, the government? So my response to that, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Chair. So I would say there are system benefits. It's, it's not just health benefits. Clearly, we have seen um, significant benefits here in the council too. To enable someone to go home first, um, reduces dependency and um, long term. Um, and this one come out hospital much quicker means that they are not becoming dependent and let's be honest, becoming more poorly the longer they spend um, in a hospital bed and decompensation. Um, certainly ADAS and the local government have been making real good representation um, to central government and I'm not too sure if committee members saw um, the witness statements at the Health and Social Care Select Committee that's chaired by um, Jeremy Hunt. I think it was the first week in September and there were really powerful witness statements both by the LGA and ADAS about the long-term future funding um, of social care. Um, I guess we need to be honest that just with COVID um, and all that's brought over the last kind of six to seven months, um, the government are kind of implying um, they won't be able to produce their long-term proposals um, for adult social care and that's important document we've all been waiting for is likely to be delayed till 2021. I guess we're, we're, we're in a position now as a council where we can really see the benefits of all of these schemes now and um, so there's 13 of them that we're currently funding. Uh, we are as you would imagine going to a review of those 13 schemes to see if we can do things differently with them um, and in, in doing that um, there's been a presentation going to the Joint Commissioning Board um, where our CCG representatives sit on that board for a conversation about, as a system, what do we value? As a system, what is the demand? As a system, what do we need um, moving forward? I'm presuming as well there might be some hard decisions have to be taken at that point. Yes. I mean, we, we would have to do an equality impact assessment if we were looking to, to reduce the scheme. Um, I guess from a council position, you know, if if we absolutely need to have those schemes in place, then we would need to find um, some savings elsewhere um, yeah. to, 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 to fund those. Um, Madge, I've got I've got you down next. Yes, when uh, a patient is discharged from the acute sector into one of the um, discharge to assess beds. Uh, what clinical information goes with the patient to the um, assessment bed? OK, shall I take that? Um, thank you very much um, for the question. So in relation to um, clinical information, um, normally what happens um, due to COVID, things happen really, really quickly. So what we do know is that individuals that have to be, that are dis medically fit for discharge, um, have to be discharged within three hours. So usually there is a clinical handover, usually by telephone, and then the um, information follows afterwards. So we are working within a hub model um, so that um, for an individual, we have um, all the preparation work, all the information is um, undertaken prior to and within the timeline of those three hours um, in order to transfer that patient um, and to support the um, speediness, the timeliness. Um, the, there is a, a ward to ward discussion via the telephone and then paperwork follows following that. Um, I'm only half satisfied with that answer, but we'll leave it at that, Chair. OK, um, what, what, what was it you weren't satisfied with, Madge? You well, to... I'm, I'm looking at it from a, a position as if I was a nurse in one of these beds to assess and I just had a telephone conversation from the acute sector, and didn't have the actual full clinical medical notes because these patients will, because of their, their situation, will have fairly long complex clinical needs, I would think. Otherwise, why would they be transferred to a, a community hospital, for instance? Let's call it a community hospital and we all know where we are. Um, so for me, 
If I was a nurse there, I would be wanting very quickly the full clinical notes so that I knew what I was uh, doing. I can assure you on that. I wouldn't accept it if I was a nurse there. Are we talking about community hospitals here, Patricia, or are we talking about um, beds in, in nursing homes? OK, so um, uh, two elements, really. So everyone that is discharged from a hospital bed, so from acute hospital bed, there will be a an assessment that is undertaken, which is a fact finding assessment. That's a multidisciplinary assessment from the um, the the hospital hub, which identifies that individual needs and also identifies the discharge plan for that individual. So it will either state it's a bed based provision and where that bed based provision would be. So it may say a um, community hospital bed or the um, or a discharge to assess bed. So it depends on on the um, need or it could be that individual is discharged into the um, community in a, a home with um, support, so i.e. a package of care. So in addition with that, we also and we always have um, discharge summary from um, the doctor who would have assessed that individual on the ward and um, that goes with the patient. Um, alongside all the additional sort of clinical information that is required. Um, so all of that information is on the fact finding assessment and also there is a water to water transfer um, for the community hospitals for that individual um, so that they're aware of um, you know, the needs of the of the patient. So effectively, can I just jump in, Madge? Effectively, the responsibility then falls to the primary care um, sector. So I'm just wondering what impact has this had on our, on the primary care, on the GPs and what have you? Are you able to understand that impact? Can I, can I pick that uh, up the, the question around the GPs and, and the impact? Um, yeah. Would that be OK? So what we what we have with the D2A beds, we have a contract with the providers who, who do report a really positive relationship um, with the um, ICS team, particularly if they have any issues about information so that all those connections exist. But we also have the, the CCG contract, the GPs, to provide additional supports um, and, and additional time from the local GP practice. So it's an additional contract that the GPs engage into um, with, the, with the CCG so that there is um, specific support going in for those D2A beds during the period of time that people are there. So it's not it, it, it's like a, a transfer of that um, doctor's responsibility into the community for the GPs and that's agreed in advance so that the GPs know that they will be providing that additional level of support for those beds. And uh, are you getting any feedback on about that, um, that support, that additional support from the GPs? How are they coping? Because these are people that are coming out of hospital, so they're they are going to need that oversight, aren't they, of um, uh, of the GP? Um, I'm I'm just wondering how are you understanding how it's working from the GP's perspective? The GP's contract is directly with the CCG, um, but from the conversations that we have with them and from the providers who are really involved, um, they've got really positive um, relationships with the providers and they've got monthly meetings with the um, with the providers as well. Um, so it's it's sort of a, a, a tripartite conversation really with the CCG, the providers um, and the GPs, but we do get positive feedback around that. Um, I'm, 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 I've, and it's only anecdotal, so I will dig around a little bit more, but um, I've, I've had some uh, information that says it's not as working as well as it should do. But as I say, this is just from one particular GP, so I'll do a little bit more research. And I might come back to you with that separately. It, it um, would I've be got, very welcome, yeah. OK, I've got um, Heather Kidd and then Gerald Aiken. Heather. Uh, two things. Um, I'm interested in all of this and as usual I'd love to know whether you're working with the doctors just over the border in um, uh, Montgomery Shire for instance 
because half my division has a doctor in Wales and they will be coming home and that cross-border work is always difficult but actually it's quite just as essential to the people living here uh, with a Welsh doctor as it is with an English doctor. Uh, and on top of that, um, I've had a recent experience with a, uh, with a constituent who is quite seriously mentally ill. And do we do something very similar um, with Redwoods? Because she's been in there for a very long time and getting her home and just getting a meeting with her advocate and myself and the team supporting her so that she can come home has been like pulling teeth. And actually, those beds are under just as much pressure and are just as acute as the main hospitals. You're absolutely right there, Heather. And further on in the slide deck, you'll notice that we put some additional capacity, social work capacity into the Redswood Hospital because we identified early on that that was an absolute need for us to do that. This is not just about discharging patients out of the acute hospital and our community hospital this is around discharging all patients, including those that are in Redwoods. There is dedicated social work capacity in there to, to um, work with the individual, the family, the advocate, and with the wards to kind of do that really important planning work um, and making sure that we have good MDT meetings and discharge meetings well in advance of all people present um, so that we can uh, have good discharges um, from, from Redwoods Hospital. Okay, thank you. Um, Gerald. Thank you. Oh, can you hear me? Sorry. Yes, I can hear you, Gerald. As we said, this is this is this scheme has been very successful as far as um, getting people out of hospital. Now, the people depending on that are Telford and Leakin and Shropshire, also Paris. Now, Telford and Leakin seems to have got it sorted out a little bit. How are we doing with Paris? Because it will affect shops, of course, ultimately. So one of the positive outcomes that have come out of COVID is much better working relationships with our colleagues over in Paris. So our urgent care director, um, Claire Ald, um, in the NHS, has been having weekly um, meetings, calls with his Paris colleagues, of which Trish and I um, have also been um, dining into just to kind of overcome some of those challenges that we're all aware of about cross-border relationships and working across local authorities in the NHS. And I'd hope that we continue with those as we hopefully come out of COVID. They've been really, really valuable um, conversations. Um, I think I cut Heather, Heather off um, prematurely. Heather, you wanted to come back, didn't you, to um, uh, the answer from Tanya? Absolutely. And uh, partly um, my meeting that has been like pulling teeth over this very seriously mentally ill patient um, only happened this last week. And it appeared to me that the Redwoods team weren't very well um, versed in working with our social worker who was there. I don't think it had really, it, it appeared that it didn't seem to be terribly in, in integrated uh, and um, our the advocate and my concern was which is why we were forcing the meeting is that they were just going to discharge her with very little help again and this is you know so i am pleased that there's something else in place but i think there's a significant amount of work that still needs to be done with the staff at, at redwoods to make sure that this works really well because it was far from good and some of those people on that meeting had certainly not read her notes. So I was concerned about that. And the Montgomery doctors, I don't think we had a, an answer about Montgomery doctors who, who have quite a chunk of Shropshire patients. Um, OK, thank you for that. Can I pick up the issue regarding um, Redwoods? Um, so um, we are working really, really closely with our health colleagues in all of our hospitals and we have a specific um, specific links with Redwoods um, where we are actually having um, weekly meetings with them. Um, we're actually sort of forging some 
sort of great partnership work with our MDTs. Um, but we are aware that there are issues um, in the way that um, people within our mental health wards are discharged as compared to um, our acute wards. So we are um, planning to do some joint working, partnership working, um, but also some workshops with our health colleagues so that we can have a much more seamless approach for individuals um, that are being discharged from our mental health wards. Um, so that their journey, if you like, um, is no different in terms of outcomes from a patient being discharged from an acute ward or from a, one of the community hospitals. So we are looking at that and we are looking to do some joint work with our health colleagues. OK, thank you. Do you want to continue with the presentation? Sorry, Chair, could I just pick up Councillor Kidd's question regarding um, the uh, GP contracts? Um, yes. Yeah. So, so the um, the D2A beds have, have each got a contract with a, um, a GP practice. Those GP practices are all in Shropshire County. Um, where there's somebody perhaps who's in a D2A bed who is normally resident in Montgomeryshire, because all the D2A beds are in county as well, where somebody's normally resident in Montgomeryshire, there would be a, a liaison between their own GP, um, um, who, who perhaps based in Montgomeryshire, and, and the GP who's contracted to provide the additional support to the D2A Do I beds. interrupt there, Deborah? Because I think I'm seeing Heather saying that's not actually what she was referring no, to. Apologies. Referring it, could, to it could be me in hospital. My doctor is in Montgomery. It could be my husband, any of my, well, two of my daughters. We have a doctor. So residence in Shropshire. And I live here. Mm. I'm with you, right. OK, so the D2A beds are all in Shropshire based homes. We contract them in Shropshire based homes. Um, so the, the GP support for those beds will come from um, Shropshire um, based GPs. I appreciate that your usual GP would be across the border, um, but it, the, the support for the D2A beds would, would come from whichever GP has got that partnership with the home. Um, but they would liaise with your own doctor to understand any particular issues that's relevant to you. Sorry, I, I misput that. <laughs> OK, Tracy, you, you've indicated you want to ask a question. Is it related to the, this this um, stream of uh, conversation? Yes, yes. Um, thank you, Chair. It's just to do with um, the Redwoods um, debate. Um, whilst I really, really welcome closer working with Redwoods and Discharge, I think the problem is once the, the, the um, actual patients, the people that discharge are back in the community, because that's where the failings are. Not You can get all the discharge package right, you can get the nurses well working together and all the discussion, but once we're out in the community, mm -hmm. there's a massive problem because then they're often left to their own devices and there seems very, very little help and input. Um, we pick this up at the surgery with um, patients uh, presenting at the surgery, they have be being discharged, but there's no or very little package of support once they're discharged. So a few weeks later on, they're back in the same scenario, almost needing to be um, re-admitted to Redwoods because there's so little package of care. And I know this is the whole mental health issue, lack of funding, lack of support, but I just wanted to, you know, thank you for, for the input that you are doing, but actually it's a lot, a lot of bigger issue than um, just working more closely with Redwoods. OK, can I just um, make a comment on that point, please? As thank well? you, Patricia. Yeah. yeah, so thank you for that. Um, one of the um, one of the um, impact from COVID um, is that um, we, we had some guidelines um, 19th of March that told us that we had to work really, really differently with the way that we supported people, um, particularly people being discharged from hospitals. And one of the things, and we will mention it later in the slide, one of the things that was mentioned um, was that um, we needed to support more people in the community and that social workers should be community based and that's, you know, that is about to um, ensuring that um, people didn't constantly go back to hospital. There's a strong emphasis, uh, emphasis sorry, on admission avoidance, um, keeping people in the community and ensuring that, um, you know, there was a support within the community that could maintain individuals. Um, so we are doing quite a lot of um, work. Um, on that as well. Um, and the other thing was um, less assessments 
um, within the hospital setting. Um, but I will come on to that. Um, but just, I guess, a, a level of assurance that we are redirecting a lot of our activity. So not just about facilitating discharges from hospital and leaving people, but sort of a lot of management um, within the community to support and avoid people um, coming into the hospital as well. Tracy, you wanted to come back. Um, yes, I, I, I appreciate that. But my concerns are that actually you're saying more social work support, but this is a specialist area. Mental health is, are our social workers actually, um, I don't want to use the word geared up, are they trained in mental health? Because mental health issues, you're talking about mental health patients yeah. from Redwoods. This is my my primary question. Discharge from, um, from other settings, the hospital settings, does seem to be working well. They have the support in the community, but it's primarily the mental health patients I'm talking about here, they need yeah. specialist support and are our social workers able to actually give that? Thank we you. We have got a specialist mental health um, social work team and they offer, they actually support discharges from um, Redwoods. So they're, they're the specialists, um, especially social workers that are trained specifically around mental health issues. Chair, it's Tanya here. I'm just sitting here listening to the debate. I think it would be really helpful for committee maybe to suggest a further paper regarding mental health services in terms mm. of um, discharge and post-discharge support. And we could bring in um, MPFT colleagues in, into a future committee meeting. So maybe a joint paper between um, adult social care, mental health services and um, MPFT. Just a yeah. suggestion. Yeah. That would be very helpful. We'll take that on board as a recommendation. Thank you, Tanya. Do you want to continue with the slides now? Yes, thank you. I think we've um, done that. So next slide, please. I think we've covered the CHG social workers. If we go on to slide 21, Trish, and, um, and start, please, just in conscious of time. Thank you. Yeah. OK, um, so the investment enabled us to grow START, which is our um, in-house home based provision um, to support people in their own home. So it's a domiciliary care um, service um, that's provided by Shropshire. So next slides, please. OK, so we have a couple of images which actually shows the impact um, of um, growing START. So the image on the bottom left shows the actual increase of, in numbers of people that have been supported um, by START as a result, as a result of the uh, investment. So com conversely, the top left shows that there's a, de sorry, a decrease in the number of people that were supported through the external market, um, which meant that we were funding less packages of care in our reablement budget, um, which resulted in savings to the council. So I um, start grew, we were able to take on more individuals that were being discharged from um, hospital um, and less people were having to have their reablement in the um, external um, provider sector. Next slide, please. So this slide just takes you through some of the highlight performances of START. So really, really importantly, um, we were able to grow START through IBCF and um, the results, 60% of individuals that went through start reablement ended the reablement programme needing no further and no ongoing care. Um, people that were reabled through start as well, 60% um, were reabled much, much faster. So between one day and 14 days, so they went through their reablement programme um, much quicker. Um, in total, this resulted in less financial pressure on the adult social care budget um, and really, really great outcomes for those people that were leaving the service. Next slide, please. OK, so um, in terms of our hospital based provisions, and this includes um, Redwood, we were able to increase additional social work capacity um, for these areas so that it did include Redwoods um, and areas within the hospital, so A&E and frailty. And we we're also able to provide um, a dedicated hospital based um, carers lead. And again, that was to support individuals 
um, who had caring responsibilities in the hospital. So again, that supported the admission avoidance um, by enhancing um, support to those individuals. Next slide, please. OK, um, so if we combine, look uh, in total at the um, investments, um, the investment allowed us to have increased assessment capacity in all areas of hospital discharge work, but also in the community element as well, so that we're able to get throughput and individuals were not stuck in the system. Um, it enabled us to facilitate seven day working um, with our partners and that again aligned um, the, the outcomes for the individuals so that they were receiving support um, same level of support weekdays um, as at weekends. Um, we're able to reduce the length of stay and in, improve patient flow. Much better outcomes for individuals um, who are patients and for their carers. And we're also able to avoid a, um, unnecessary hospital admission, as um, mentioned earlier. Sorry. Next slide, please. Um, I'll hand you over to Deborah um, to take us through the independent trusted assessors. So just if, uh, thank you, Trisha, just give a, a brief description around the, the trusted assessors conscious of time. So the, um, essentially we um, commissioned some staff through Shropcom who are qualified um, physios and, and um, nurses um, and OTs to do um, assessments for individuals who are coming from hospital to support um, the care home sector to enable uh, those assessments to happen uh, in a very timely um, a timely way. Um, previous to that, sometimes if there are a number of care homes who a family or social worker were considering, you could have several care homes actually trying to do the assessments that the CQC require them to do. Um, so it, um, essentially, because we've got independent assessors doing that, the care homes will accept those assessments from individuals um, which meets their uh, requirements under CQC and it means that there's not multiple assessments happening for individuals in hospital which is more convenient for those people um, and, and um, enables a, a more timely discharge which ultimately reduces um, hospital waits and delays, reduces the uh, delayed um, discharge um, sorry, delayed transfers of cares um, and uh, as I say fulfills the requirements of the CQC. Over to the next slide, thank you. Oh, I'll pass you back to Trish for this one. So I think it's, it's Tanya now. Um, so we're going to jump over slide 27 because I'm really unconscious of time and I'm sure we've got further questions that we want to, to answer and have a Yes, I think so. so so on to just um, slide 28, if I may. The outcome of the combined IBCF investment, I think we've articulated that through our paper and through this presentation. So by collectively implementing these innovative measures, we have shown that we're able to support the reduction of delayed transfers of care and really transform the service to get great outcomes. I would say brilliant outcomes for individuals in Shropshire um, who, who need the use of our services. Um, our response around COVID has been remarkable as a system um, and through our work and support in the integrated hub model, we have seen a reduction in length of stay in the hospital by two and a half days and a 7% increase in the number of um, complex patients being discharged home first and within the day that they become medically fit, which is just astounding really. So, Further on, Amanda, slide um, 29. So again, in terms of the risk, if the IBCS schemes were terminated, if there was no funding um, available for 21-22, again, I think we had a really good debate and discussion um, throughout this morning, but just the highlights really is that um, we would no doubt see an increase in delayed transfers of care without these schemes. Um, there'd be reduced health outcomes, so we talk a lot about decompensation, so for every hour an individual lies in a hospital bed that doesn't need to be there, has a real big detrimental effect on, on their long-term health. Um, serious risk of reputational um, damage to the council and to the system, um, increased pressure on the hospital bed, so we know within this system, you know, we have, we have a real pressure in this system in terms of beds. 
Um, and, and this winter will be like no other in terms of winter, the flu, and, and managing and, and working and living with COVID. Um, and then finally, um, slide, 30, uh, slide 30, sorry. So I won't read all that out, but it's just to kind of highlight that, um, that whilst we're waiting confirmation of whether the IBCF grant will be rolled over into base budget, we are continuing alongside um, the LGA and with ADAS um, to really push forward and ensure that the IBCS grant is not just continually rolled over year on year, but actually it's, it comes into a, a much wider um, agreement about long term sustainable funding um, for adult social care. Um, we've no doubt taken really bold steps in delivery of our services um, through the IBCS. It's provided with valuable evidence based learning platform. We've been able to test out opportunities and that has made real sustainable differences. Just look at the two carers in the car example. And, and I guess finally, we are really proud of what we've achieved um, as a system over the last um, three straight four years. We have got real ambitious plans for the future. Um, and now is our opportunity to gain more traction on that work um, that we have started, uh, which has been supported by the Improved Better Care Fund. Thank you. Um, thank you, um, Tanya, um, for that, and Patricia and Deborah. I suppose, I mean, the, the, one of the main reasons I think uh, that we asked for this to come to the committee was um, the, the recognition of the risks should, uh, around funding and, um, you know, what was in place should funding not be forthcoming. Um, and I think we all recognise the value of the schemes that you've illustrated so far and the fact that they've demonstrated savings, considerable savings to earn themselves a position and the, the, the retention of those schemes for the local authority. Um, so they've almost washed their own face, so to speak, you know, by the savings that they brought in. But should um, the, uh, the decisions, and you said you're going to go through an evaluation process with your health partners soon, um, and once you start to go through that evaluation of the um, sustainability of the schemes, um, you also mentioned that you would be bringing in um, assessments, impact assessments. I think there is then, at that point, uh, a role for scrutiny again. Um, it does feel as though should you have to take some of these difficult decisions of um, services that uh, are of great use to the people and residents of Shropshire, we would like to be assured um, about the impact assessments. I'd really welcome that. Thank you, Chair. And may I suggest that in the November um, committee, we have an item again on IBCS because by that point, I'm I'm hopeful the government would have made their announcement in the autumn statement in terms of is it a rollover based on this year's funding or is it more? Um, and also we will have our conversations in the Joint Commissioning Board with our health colleagues um, regarding these schemes and the impact of any being lost. That's 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 really useful to know that that was going to be my next question. Is there any indication of timelines from the government? Although I know they're not completely reliable at the moment because everything seems to be in a state of flux. But yes, we can take that on board for, as an update to come back in November. Um, Gerald, I've got a question from you and then Dean, you wanted to come in. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I think that what, what's, what's been happening here is fantastic work. Now, I know that START has been around for quite some time. Now, if, if it's coming back uh, in de December with another report, I wonder if it's possible to have some examples of how START works. I know it's been about for a long time and I know it's effective, but I don't know quite how it works. I wonder if it's possible to have some examples of how START works. Very happy to do that if, uh, if committee would like us to do that in our, in our next presentation. We can certainly um, give some examples and have some real life um, examples and people's stories, absolutely. OK, that's that's super. Um, Dean, did you want to come in? Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, if I may, I'd just like to um, reflect a little bit on on what's what's been presented to um, committee today there's a lot of information there but I'd like to highlight a couple of things that maybe were that 
modesty maybe slightly prevented um, our fantastic team of officers from highlighting particularly. Now there are some really big numbers and by big numbers I don't mean in the millions, I mean big by implication numbers attached to, to some of these schemes and you've only seen um, a small number mm. of some of the more high profile schemes that we've been able to run through the ICBF. But if I refer you specifically to two carers in a car, what was sort of brushed over, but I think it's worth bringing the committee's attention back to, is that satisfaction as, re as reported by users of that project is 100%. I can't think of any other project that this council or probably any other council has run where users have reported 100% satisfaction in that. So I think that is definitely worth um, being drawn out of those numbers. And the other really, really significant number that I think is definitely worth um, looking at is in regards to delayed transfers of care and looking at the first year's um, improvement, 2017 to 2018, a 98% decrease in delayed transfers of care, 98%. If you're looking for immediate impact from uh, a project, I don't think you could get much more immediate or impactful than that. And I think those two really, really important points were sort of slightly not quite drawn out um, to the, in the way that they deserve to be. I think, as I said, probably through the modesty of the team. So I think that's firstly worth committee's attention. Secondly, I think what is apparent now, partly through COVID, partly through changes of personnel is the, the health and care system in Shropshire is working closer than ever before as an integrated health and care system. And I've heard a couple of questions around, well, does this scheme benefit X NHS Trust? How much does it benefit Shropshire Council? And my, my comment to that, my response to that would be that where the world we are in now what benefits one part of the health and care system benefits the whole health and care system locally. Increasing capacity in one part improve, it increases capacity and improves the patient experience throughout the system. And at the end of the day, these changes, the finances of them are important. And we've seen that just for example, the two carers in a car, the net savings of that have been almost a single year's investment of the IC, IBCF funding. But what's more important still than the financial element is the patient experience and the residents experience. And that has been immeasurably improved by the actions we've been able to take through the IC, IBCF funding and investment. We know that if somebody is in, in hospital longer than they have to be for a long period of time. Their risk of, acquire, of a hospital acquired infection increases with every day. The, their use of muscle, muscle wastage increases every day. Once that gets to a critical point, the, the option of being able to go back into their own home and live independently suddenly becomes a lot more difficult. So, all of these things increase the lived experience of the patients in the health system and the residents of Shropshire who increase our the experience, our health and care system as a whole. And that is where we have always been coming from. And I think just before I shut up, because I know that you are anxious at the time, I do want to pay a particular tribute to Tanya, to Deb and to Tricia. Yep. They've done a fantastic job and their teams have done a fantastic job. Some of this sounds simple, but it's actually been real cutting edge stuff that has been thought of outside the box. And so I think I know committee will rightly have questions, but I think that they deserve 
a lot of credit, all the credit for, for what for what they've achieved. And it just goes to emphasise the importance of the IBCF funding. We will continue to lobby government to ensure that it carries on. But my from my perspective as a cabinet member is that if and it's a big gear, but if that doesn't continue in future years, that actually the experience for residents and the cost implications will lead me to go to our finance team and say, this is something, these are things that we still need to be funding. So um, I'll finish there. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, um, Dean. I, I, you know, I think we all echo um, your thoughts on the, the value of the, the team and the excellent work that they've put into um, the IBCF and the BCF. Um, and I also think that your comments underline why this um, committee is so keen to understand should there be any decommissioning or discontinuation of any of these services, the impact um, assessment that will be huge. Um, you know, and it is all because it is all about the quality of life for Shropshire residents. And that is why we're taking such a deep interest in it. Um, so, yes, thank you very much. I'm going to um, I think we'll get out of this. We've got a couple of um, if they're recommendations, I suppose that they, they are as, as follows. We want to actually maybe investigate a little more the discharge, the post discharge and discharge. Um, of mental health patients into uh, into the community or into um, a, a, a setting, nursing setting, and uh, that would would need that cooperation uh, and joint reporting with MPFT. Um, we'd like that to come to uh, a future meeting so we can pick that up. Tanya, I'm just going to ask you when and, and what would be the optimum timing for that? Would that would be next year, early next year? I think would it? Um, I think so, Chair. I've got a couple of comments to make, if I may. So, um, Healthwatch are, have or are about to launch a survey for individuals who have gone through any discharge from hospital process yeah. um, during the last six months. And I'd really urge um, people to go on to the Shropshire Council website to look at that or straight onto the Healthwatch um, site. Yeah. And then secondly, um, members may or may not be aware, but on Friday evening at half past nine, we had... Um, to, to government um, a, a winter plan that was published uh, and also the, the um, social care task force report was published late on Friday. Um, they're two key documents. Now I've read through them um, once over the weekend and I, I would like to, to bring something back to committee if I may in November about that because um, for the social care task force report there are 52 recommendations now this task force was set up in light of learning from this first wave of covid and mm. making sure that um, we we take that learning on board as a, as a system and and we put good things in place to, to support the system into winter um so just to have that in mind if i may in terms of your future agenda items so i think for the mental health one i think if that could be perhaps January, that would we could then perhaps talk about the winter plan and the social care task force report in November as a suggestion. OK, we can take that forward into the discussion on our next agenda item. Tanya, would be kind enough to send the links through to those two reports. Um, that yes, would be very absolutely. helpful. Yes, yeah, yes. absolutely. <clears throat> that would be great. Thank you very much. Um, and then we with the also the other one that we've got is the IBCF report, of course, in November, because hopefully by then you will have some indication. Well, not report, but an update on where we're standing in terms of um, funding, future funding. Um, so all that leads me to do is I don't think I think we can just take and say those items through to the next gender item is to say thank you very much um, Tanya, uh, Patricia and Deborah for your input into today's uh, meeting and for the good work the brilliant work that you've been doing and thank Dean thank you very much for attending thank you very much thank you thank you can we now go thank on you. to the next item which is the future work program Daniel, over to you. I think we, we're sort of filling it up, aren't we, bit by bit? 
Hello there, Chair. Yes, this, uh, I'm Daniel Webb, an overview and scrutiny officer here at uh, Shropshire Council. Uh, and indeed, actually, I've been furiously taking notes during the course of this meeting. And you now have a very full agenda mm. going forward for the next few meetings. Uh, I've been uh, working with officers here and with yourselves um, to try and flesh out uh, this item with regards to domiciliary services. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I'll be working with officers this week to um, to bring sort of to, to put a brief together for that. So we've got some meaningful to bring uh, to the committee for you. Um, we've been looking as well around arrangements in a single commissioning structure, although uh, at the moment that might yet go over to the Joint Health and the Scrutiny Committee. Obviously, we don't want to duplicate work that's happening there. I mean, it, it would seem that every meeting we have seems to come back to commissioning again and again and again. Mm -hmm. So I understand why this committee wants to look at it, but we just do need to make sure that we're not um, spending too much time uh, with officers asking the same questions. Um, uh, th throughout the course of the meeting, you've, you've, you've asked for a few things to come back and these are the notes I've got so far. Um, in November, you'd like the Improved Better Care Fund to come back to the meeting. Uh, you'd like an update on um, uh, arrangements following the government's announcements for yeah. in its open spending review. Yeah. Uh, some examples of work arising from staff funding. So I've made a note of that. Mm. Um, you've also asked uh, in January to receive um, a plan from Director of Public, uh, sorry, Director of Public Health on um, on on her proposals for a joint strategic needs assessment, both the general one for the council and a specific one for children and young people with special mm -hmm. education need on mm -hmm. disability. So you've asked that to come um, a resource plan as well, rather than an mm -hmm. plan. Mm -hmm. So we have something concrete uh, that we can track in the future. So that's going to be coming in January mm -hmm. um, with. Um, more detail on the role and the work of the board's commissioning subgroup uh, which you raised some concerns about in the course of this meeting. Um, also in January you've got two fairly meaty items you wanted to do a review of the carry out review of the 111 services in Shropshire um, and you also wanted to look at the memorandums of understanding for substituted services uh, following uh, the one year anniversary uh, of implementing those. Uh, that's a lot to get through. That's not to say that we can't, of course. Um, you might, some of that might spill into March yet, but obviously we'll see uh, how, how that pans out as we, as we plan for those meetings. Uh, that's all for me. Isn't it? Have I missed anything out? No, I'm just looking through my notes, Daniel. I don't think so. Um, well, I think he's got it all, Chair. From the notes I've made. Yeah, I, I think that that's all of it. Um, there, were two, there were two other items. I've not penciled them in yet to any particular date. Um, one was around mental health inpatient discharges. Um, uh, and again, that might merit just a little bit of a conversation with uh, your joint health colleagues. So now they're looking at um, mental health as well to make sure that you don't duplicate work there. And also around the social care task force reporting, which Tanya will bring back to the meeting in November. So I'll liaise with her on that. Yes, that, that would be helpful. And we can have that conversation. Um, I'm not about tomorrow, but we can have that conversation next week with um, with Telford and Recon, can't we? About you know, is there any crossover and um, uh, is it worth our while going ahead with uh, with that on our own or or should we do it jointly? Okay. You ought to do it jointly, Chairman. This this mm. business it, it it just duplicates, and I think it causes yeah. a degree of confusion too to officers. I would think. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, we're not we're not short of items for a November meeting. Whatever we decide, yeah. uh, we'll uh, press on accordingly. Uh, if you're if if the committee are happy with the mm. process of that. Yeah, I'm just looking at the chat and I'm sorry, um, Simon, I forgot to ask about the, the Brosley project and uh, we could have asked them, the officers then. I think maybe we'll just ask for um, uh, separately. I'll email Tanya and just ask her for a Brosley project update um, and uh, I'll, uh, circulate her response, uh, if that's OK. I do apologise, I, I forgot that one. Uh, in the in the list. Um, so Daniel, I think we've got the future work program um, well and truly um, filled out. Marvellous. Um, 
and are any actions coming from this we can pick up later? Yeah, okay. indeed. Well, it's okay, then I will uh, draft to circulate accordingly. Yeah, perfect. Are there any other comments from members? No. No, well, I can close the meeting then, or I can ask Amanda to close the, the live meeting. Thank you very much, members, for your attendance and participation. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, Karen. Thanks, Thank everybody. Bye. Bye. Bye.